It was word of mouth that propelled the novel We Need to Talk About Kevin onto the bestseller lists. It had been given very little publicity. Its author, Lionel Shriver, my guest today, had struggled to find a publisher in the first place. It was deemed too dark and uncomfortable a read. The musings of a mother on the son she never really liked, who turns into a mass killer. Now the story has been made into a critically acclaimed film and is about to reach even larger audiences. So why has such an unnatural tale proved so compelling? Lionel Shriver, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Tell us what it's like to be sitting in Cannes, watching your novel turned into a film with notable actors and actresses in, and to know that only a few years ago you were struggling with a manuscript to get a publisher. Well, life has improved. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it must be quite, it must be an amazing feeling to watch. It's exciting, but at the same time, it's strangely. Uh, distant, uh, not just because I wrote the novel some time ago, but also the film is not my creation, but it uses my characters, my plot, and even my point. But it, it isn't mine in the same way, and there's a release in that. I, I quite enjoy the dispassion with which I greet it. It's, it's Lynn Ramsey's creature. But when you watched it, I mean, I, many novelists describe how uncomfortable and how they dislike watching a film because mm. it's so different. She was true to the themes of your book and you seemed very happy in what you've said thus far about the film in the way the book was portrayed. I am happy with it and I think I'm very fortunate because a lot of novelists have their uh, their books turned into films that are unrecognizable, that take lots of liberties, that tear the guts out and uh, th this is not the case. It's a very faithful film. It has its own slant uh, but that's to be expected. But it's not your, it's your characters on, on, on the screen then? Yes, and uh, it makes up a few scenes, but for the most part I recognize the scenes from the book. Okay. In it, fact, one of the things that was just hilarious for me is seeing, you know, like the, the name of the shabby travel agent that the main character uh, works at in the present tense, and it's called Travel Are, uh, travel are Us, um, which is meant to be tacky. And, um, it was just a name that I grabbed out of the air one day, on some ordinary afternoon, and then the poor filmmakers actually have to construct a whole travel R Us and paint the sign, and to see these things literalized, these small, sometimes rather arbitrary choices, uh, turned into the, the concrete and filmable. It's, re it's really hilarious for a, for a fiction writer. Now, it's something, there's something about this book, though, because Lynn Ramsey, who made the film, mm -hmm. I mean, she wanted, decided she wanted to make a film, but before it was, it was even a commercial success, didn't she? Yes. Uh, she took a shine to it before it was even on the bestseller list. And it, that seems to have been a process that was repeated many times. I mean, you, because you had approached, what, 30 different publishing houses, British publishing houses? I um, tried to get an agent with this book. Uh, I went through 17 agents uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, before I finally went directly to a publisher. And uh, to that woman's credit, uh, she read it over the weekend and bought it the, on Monday. <laughs> uh, but over in the U.K., once we started trying to sell the British rights, it went to 30 different companies before this little engine that could Serpent's Tail um, bought it for. I don't even remember how little, but it was something like 2,000 pounds. It was pathetic. Uh, but by then, we just uh, wa wanted it out in print. I live in the UK, and it was important that it be published here to me. So, uh, so we accepted, and the rest is history. Yeah, you describe how when you wrote to your New York literary agent at the time mm -hmm. that you received back a, a long, unparagraphed, associative wail of dismay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and a request that you pay your photocopying bill. I mean, she t just did not like. She hated it. And uh, fair enough, I'm glad that because she they didn't, didn't think represent it. But they, they she thought it was evil. She she honestly thought it was evil, and that 
it suggested that I was evil. So, have you had communication with her since? Only a little. We ran into each other at a literary party and it was rather an icy meeting. <laughs> so, what is it, do you think? She thinks it's evil, and yet it did strike a chord. It struck a chord with Lynn Ramsey. It struck a chord with women, because the first piece of uh, publicity that, about it, or one of the earliest one, was an article suggesting that there were these women in, in New York who were biking the book over to each other. So excited were they about this mm. book. I think that uh, not only women, but uh, parents and prospective parents uh, were grateful to see um, parenthood depicted in fiction in a way that uh, took away the rose-colored glasses. It's de-romanticized. So it's not simply a book uh, about uh, a high school killer. It's also about the uh, early stages of raising a kid and how frustrating it is and how, frankly, sometimes boring it is. And here, you know, you've may maybe you have a master's degree and you're teaching your child the alphabet. It, it, it is not necessarily exhilarating. And, and I think that readers were grateful to see a portrayal of a family which wasn't just, you know, little kids around a dinner table saying witty beyond their years things. But it was more than that, though. It wasn't just the boredom. It was a mother who didn't like her child. I think it's a novel that recognizes that just because a, a, a child is from you doesn't mean that they are are related to you in, in emotionally that, that in fact children are strangers whom you have to get to know and you may or may not like them and most parents probably do have at least bursts of dislike and frustration with uh, their kids and uh, I think that this book gives people like that permission because previously we've been told, you know, you have this undying, unqualified, unconditional love for your child. And when you don't always experience that, you think there's something wrong with you. And uh, essentially the media is always telling you one way or another that if you don't feel that way, you'd better keep your mouth shut. And this is a novel that finally gave uh, women in particular permission to think negative things about their child on occasion without necessarily thinking that they're bad mothers and bad people. You breached what you, you described it as the last taboo, this idea of... Yes, it was amazing I could find a taboo left that we hadn't broke, broken right, left and center. But apparently, especially uh, the unqualified uh, love between mother and son uh, was something that we're, we were not, uh, until recently, ready to question. But there was a reaction to it. I mean, you became the sort of poster girl, you described as a poster girl for maternal ambivalence. But also people looked at your own life and said, how, how can you know because you chose not to have, have any children? Uh, and which you've written about in the later versions of this book as well. As a sort of one of your, it was one of your fears, one of the main reasons you didn't have children, as a fear that, that you might not love your child. Well, I concede that it was cheeky of me to write a novel about a, a mother-son relationship when I didn't have any children myself. Though I think that uh, the fact that I didn't have children, and especially didn't have a son, made it possible to write this book. If I had, um, a, if I had a son uh, who I knew would be able to grow up and read it, I think it would have been inhibiting. So the reaction to it, I mean, it's interesting to see that the reaction from women, did you, it was polarizing in many ways, wasn't it? Interestingly, what polarized uh, the readership uh, was the issue of responsibility. That is, it's a novel that poses the question um, dryly, of course, nature versus nurture. Um, whose fault was this atrocity? Is Was the problem that uh, this poor little boy grew, grew up with a loveless mother and was uh, distorted into uh, a monster? Or was there something wrong with this kid from birth that uh, his, and that's not his mother's fault? And the readership really cleaved into fierce camps. I gather that this has been a big book club book. And uh, they, I've been told over and over again of book clubs that just got into ferocious fights 
be because uh, half of them thought it was all the mother's fault and she'd been a, an atrocious parent and in some ways got what she deserved and the other half said no that kid was sick uh, it wasn't her fault. She did. She made a soldierly effort, and she couldn't have done anything um, to uh, to prevent what happened. And I I love this stuff. I mean, I, I I like to sit on the sidelines and watch them fight it out. And you studiously sat on the sidelines. You won't give your vote. Oh, there's always a point at, uh, when I do an event and uh, someone raises their hands and says, "Well, you know, now that we've got you here, uh, could you please settle this issue? You know, was it Kevin's?" Uh, was it Kevin's fault? He was there something wrong with him, or was it the mother's fault? And and I uh, pretty reliably say that if I haven't told you uh, across the course of uh, 400 pages, I'm not <laughs> going to do it now. Um, that that whole question, though, I mean, and you have been you've been asked to sort of uh, about your own experiences. Why? Because you said at the age, you decided what at the age of seven, eight. eight. I wasn't that precocious. <laughs> uh, that you didn't want to have children. That's right. Did you, so w there was never a moment's broodiness in your life? I wouldn't call it broodiness, but the closest I came to re-examining that decision was w writing this book. And, but you, and you wrote this book at the point in your 40s when I, it would have been the last chance to... That's right. And, uh, you know, let's not l let eight-year-old vows go unexamined in adulthood. Uh, so I had, I had to think about it. And, most of all, uh, the book is a contemplation of what about motherhood frightened me. And uh, it turns out that a great deal about motherhood frightens me. The, the original manuscript was even 200 pages longer, <laughs> full of more horrors. So what is it? What is it about motherhood that frightens you, aside from the mess and the boredom of teaching the alphabet to a child? The, the subsidiarity, if that is a word, the putting someone else first and I know that that doesn't um, make me sound very good but that's alright I'm not used to putting someone else first and being really morally obliged to put someone else first I was anxious that it would uh, it would disturb my sense of who I was uh, that that the invasion of of another person and another person's need would obliterate me in some ways and I think that women often have this experience of uh, having uh, who who they understand to be unsettled uh, that, uh, that having a child just completely shakes up their confidence about about their own identity it's such an it was such an unusual argument to hear made when you came up with Kevin and you made this point did you get a response from some women who hadn't had children at last? Somebody saying, look, I could be here for another reason. I, I did get uh, any number of people, uh, and still do, coming up to me and saying, you know, I, now I, you have justified my decision, or um, perhaps even worse, you know, my boyfriend and I read that book and now we've decided we're not having kids. <laughs> and that was never the purpose of the novel. And I never intended to become a poster girl for barren women. Uh, I am not on a campaign to stop reproduction and therefore to bring the human race to a conclusion. But you, you said, because the whole, you know, the idea of what it, what it means to be female, you described, in fact, your decision when you were 15 to change your name from Margaret Ann to Lionel. You are quoted as saying, I always resented the confinement of being yes. female. Yes. Did you then feel confined? Do you feel now that you are confined? Well, of course, we're all confined by one thing or another. And uh, one of the things that confines me now is that I don't have children. So it, the, the experience of, of parenthood and of lineage, carrying on a lineage, uh, is closed off to me. So that's a kind of confinement. I mean, we make our choices and, and, and we are trapped by them. So but you didn't feel any more confined to being a woman. I, the presumption is because if you're being conf you change your name to a man's name, Lionel, mm -hmm. that actually you want to be a man. I want to be everybody. I want to be both genders. That's what fiction writing is about. It is an exploration. It is a, it is a, a trying to get out, right? 
it's trying to understand what it's like to be other people and that's true from the for the writer as well as for the reader and of course I'm a big reader too okay but now when you look at some of the other subjects that you've done a perfectly good family mm -hmm. um, you I mean you you kind of you're described as sort of fairly merciless unrelenting these are the words often used to describe some of your work and and what you did with a perfectly good family was write about a family which had three siblings and it was about the inheritance and you are of course one of three children and it caused tremendous problems in your own family because something I mean you I think you used the word you knew you were entering perilous territory why was that well I instinctively want to enter perilous territory uh, that's where when it starts getting interesting uh, that is the only book that I've ever written that was more or less based on um, people I knew and in this case my family. Now that said, the uh, setting is, is made up, it's a fight between three siblings over the inheritance of the house in which they grew up. This is not a house in which I grew up. and uh, Your parents are very much alive. My parents are very much alive. So it was an interest. I mean, there, as, as ever, there was the story in the book, and then there's the story of the book, and the story of the book in this case was at least as big as the one in, and I, my, my family was very upset by that. And it was, it, it was one of those damned if you do and damned if you don't things, because, uh, you know, if, if you change lots of things, you know, you change the perfections and the plot and everything, you change everything, and then, and then they say, well, I didn't do that, and I didn't say that. This is a total distortion. But if you use anything from real life, it's a, it's a betrayal and a, and and an exposure. And but we should explain the consequences so. of this book were that your parents threatened to disinherit you. Your your younger brother, you're very close to, didn't speak to you for a couple of years. That's right. Have you? I mean, have, has your relationship with your family been patched up since? Yes, it has. But it's patched up rather than back to what it was. Everyone remembers, and so do I things were said that shouldn't have been said and I'm glad that uh, we've all got past it and it gave me some pause uh, I've I've had to reflect since uh, now that I'm not obliged to be quite so defensive that if somebody wrote a book in which I was a character and not portrayed in an, in an entirely flattering light I don't think I'd like it either I mean, if there's any justice in this world, somebody is out there writing about me. And, and there, unfortunately, there isn't usually justice in this world. And yet you've said of it, though, that even knowing what, if you knew what would have happened, you would still have written the book. That's right. I mean, it's a good book, as far as I'm concerned. It's, uh, it's funny. It gets out uh, an interesting issue. Uh, about inheritance and, and yet it damaged your relationship with your family irrevocably uh, I don't remember who it was who said that uh, writers have to have a little uh, piece of ice in their heart and I, I suppose I do and it, that that yes I would make that emotional sacrifice to still have that book I don't think that necessarily reflects well on me uh, but I like the book and I'm still glad I wrote it. Now that said, if I had it all to do over again, I think I would find five or six lines that I would get rid of. And the book would still still be just as good without those lines. And they were unnecessarily hurtful. But that's not the kind of perspective that you often achieve by publication. That's the kind of perspective that you get mm -hmm. ten years later. But you, here you are, you say you like perilous territory. It's the interesting territory. You mm -hmm. like the, the difficult things. I mean, one, many people might wonder what's driving you because every single, your treatment of every story is a sort of, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. It makes difficult reading. I mean, people who, who read your books and will say, look, it can change your life. But my goodness, they didn't almost wanted to put it down because it's so tough right. to read. What, what, we don't need more books in which boy meets girl, boy and girl break up, boy and girl get together again. I mean, there are a lot of books out there 
I want to make some kind of contribution in the short time I'm around. So I'm looking. in the corners, in the dark corners, where nobody has explored before. And uh, that way I'm serving a purpose. And I'm very interested in, uh, in the difference between what life is supposed to be like and what it's really like. And uh, Kevin, for example, is, is an exploration of that dissonance. And I think it's a dissonance that most normal people feel. This is not just something for fictional characters or writers. You're always dealing with the tension between your expectations and what you have been told uh, some adulthood is like or getting married is like. And then you find out for yourself and it's very different. And I'm right. I'm, would you I'm, write about your husband? Sure I would. Sure I would. He hasn't banned you. No, he's incredibly generous on that point. Uh, he's made an appearance from time to time in one form or another and uh, and he just says that's fiction and that's your job and and he's never said you'd better take that out he's, and it doesn't. he's because very open-hearted on that point uh, you're writing about uh, your brother or at least the, you're writing about obesity because your elder brother that's a book that I haven't published yet yes which so, but you've completed now? No, I have not. I'm still in the first draft. It's almost almost finished. And what drove you to to turn to the subject was that your brother died young, basically, Quite. as a result of as a result of obesity. The complications of morbid obesity. Yes, he had diabetes, and 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 but particularly the, your particular concern is the way that we it, the movement within a, the United States in particular that look, hey, look, this is, a, this is an acceptable way to live. No, I'm not writing about the fat pride movement. It's more personal than that. But uh, and there will come a time that I am more interested in talking about this book. It's not done yet. But it's exactly the kind of subject that I'm always on the lookout for because on the one hand, it's a larger social problem. It's becoming a huge economic problem in the, uh, the health service in the UK as well as in the US. But it's also a supremely personal problem and an emotional one. You know, people, people have intense feelings about their weight these days. And because of that, that's what I'm always looking for, is that it has some social ramifications but it's perfect for fiction because it's a private story. What seems strange about you in many ways is that you write these difficult, write about difficult subjects, you write about them in, in a difficult way, in an unforgiving way, and yet you are, have written also about how thin-skinned you are with critics. You don't like, you remember I have said that I tend to remember the bad reviews more than the good ones. You forget the good ones. Uh, absolutely, and I think if you talk to most writers, they'd say the same thing. Uh, and uh, I don't think I'm particularly thin-skinned. It is ludicrous to pretend that uh, you know if someone says incredibly mean things about something that you work very hard on, and it it doesn't affect you. Uh, on the other hand, my experience with uh, Kevin has been that I have now read, and I'm sorry to sound arrogant, but it's just the truth, I have now read so many positive reviews of that book that uh, when I trip across a negative one, I blow it off. I mean, there, there, was one, uh, there was one from the Irish Times that was so over the top, she hated it so much, she hated it. Uh, that it made me laugh. I mean, so on, on, on that book, it's like, it's, it's done well. I'm not worried about it. Lionel Shriver, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. My pleasure.